Welcome, Heather. Thanks for coming on. Moms don't have time to read books to talk about raising a rare girl, your amazing memoir. Thanks for having me. I'm so, so thrilled to be here. Oh, of course. Um, for those who don't know, could you please give a quick little synopsis of what Raising a Rare, rare Girl is about? And also, like, what inspired you to write this memoir? Yeah, it's about, um, well, it's about raising my daughter uh, for the first five years or so of her life. Um, she, ha- she, she was um, born very, very small, and that sort of shocked everybody in the world, in the room, in me, because... I had like ventured to have this like absolutely super healthy baby and did all the right things and um, and went like overboard to do all the right things and um, she was incredibly tiny so at, at full term she was four pounds twelve ounces and uh, we eventually learned that she had this very rare chromosomal syndrome called Wolf Hirschhorn syndrome where she has this little deletion on one of her chromosomes on the fourth chromosome so the book is about uh, the first a lot of it's devoted to the first year and the sort of disorientation of learning about that diagnosis in the midst of parenting, the lack of normality in my life um, as like parenting is really mapped by normal, like the map of normal, you know, like what the baby does and when the baby does it. And and even when you can't find common ground at the play group about like politics or jobs, you can usually find common ground on like when some your baby puts something in his or her mouth. And uh, like, just I just wasn't in that club at all. I wasn't in the, that club of de- typical development. And my daughter had a lot of other things to teach me. So the first year is a lot of like processing that, feeling disoriented, feeling grief for the trajectory I thought this child would have. Um, and then the several the so that's about it takes up about a, you know half the book, and then the other half of the book is devoted to life after kind of reorientation. Like, uh, what does it look like to advocate for her? What does it look like to um, encounter, be a good medical advocate, to encounter doctors who belittle her, um, to give her language and communication when her mouth wasn't capable of it at the time? So, that's the book. And I couldn't believe the reactions, how greatly they differed among different doctors and like people who were so rude and so negative and without almost regard for how you were feeling at all. And then other doctors who were sort of minimizing and I don't know, it's like, I don't know how you go from one, all these different spectrums of advice. It's a lot. Yeah, we encountered a lot of different doctors. Um, and, you know, I was the kind, I, I had never had like a condition that required me to show up for regular appointments and just went for like an annual checkup. So this was my, this was like, I saw more doctors with Fiona in her first several months than probably my whole life. And what I learned really quickly was like, get a second opinion should you ever need one. So, you know, like there just are so many different approaches and so much of someone's personality comes into play when they when they actually give you medical advice so um so yeah i learned quite a bit about doctors and like reading the room really quickly you know the doctor that would come in and like be enthusiastic about her and like treat her like a kid they were they were good doctors you know they immediately off they often gave us really good advice in the end too and the doctor that was like troubled by her various ways that she was different um you know, usually we didn't, we never, we didn't want to return to them, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Um, you know, you captured so well how um, expecting moms try to do everything right and the pressure that we feel. I mean, I have four kids of my own, like each time, I mean, I had a twin pregnancy, so that was like a whole nother thing. But um, just the pressure that we have on ourselves that like, if we don't, if we eat this turkey instead of that turkey, like what could happen to our child? And just like the pressure in addition to the physical that moms are under to like have these perfect pregnancies and therefore expect these perfect outcomes. And um, I don't know. I mean, it, I feel like you share this sort of belief, but it's like we cannot control anything. <laughs> like no matter how much you do all the right things for in any part of life, it's all just kind of a hoax. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think that the, there, there's a lot of illusion of control that's like really put on contemporary motherhood. And I, um, Sarah Menkedick's book, Ordinary Insanity, it just came out in like April. It's about postpartum anxiety and depression, but it's about so much more. Um, and she writes a lot about like the pressure that women feel to, um, to, to like produce perfect children or to like the pressure that we feel to um, ensure that our kids are developing normally. And also the like combination of that as like a natural thing uh, um, and uh, 
how that sort of can it be, can be the perfect storm for anxiety. So she writes a lot about anxiety and does all these interviews. I didn't have postpartum anxiety in any sort of clinical way, but it, I think her, her argument, Sarah Menkedik's argument is that baseline motherhood is anxiety and that we've sort of accepted that as normal and it's not. It's not it shouldn't be like it shouldn't be okay that we're all feeling this sort of pressure to keep everybody perfect or suffering free or pain free. Yeah, there's yeah. very little we can control. I did not even know postpartum anxiety was a thing until fairly recently. And I was like, huh, that's so funny. That's just life. Like that is not how is that a thing? That's not even a medical term. But um anyway, yeah. um and you you did such a good job too when you were in the hospital at the very beginning and they said that you were supposed to rest and you kind of even felt guilty for that despite just having had a child. Um yeah. and you're like, I've done all these things and every you know, but now that's my one mandate is like I've spit a child out of me and now I can relax. And then of course you quickly realize that like you can't just rest. Now you also have to worry. Um yeah. which is like something that people try to control and you're like no no this is now i have to take this on because what's going on um yeah. so yeah well that was definitely communicated to me in the hospital and they literally wrote you know what's your agenda for today yeah rest and i was like oh yes and also really i've yeah. never rested um which is you know i'm better at resting now that i'm a mom but uh or at least like trying to take a, an hour to be like you need to do nothing um but it was clear that they didn't mean that at all. They meant, because they, they were so concerned about her size that they meant, um, if you want to breastfeed, like, let's get, you know, we have to start getting you with lactation consultants. We have to be, she has to be fed, you know, around the clock. And there was a lot of stress. There was a lot of stress on me. So it was interesting, even in my postpartum fog, to read the cultural cues there, you know, rest mom, take care of yourself you know, breastfeed your baby or she will like, I don't know, you know, she'll be doomed to live a non breastfed life. So <laughs> a lot of pressure. And of course, you raise the issue that over time, different groups of people have had sort of different culturally accepted um, child standards in a way and that in the olden days, they would send off, you know, babies with Down syndrome to a home or they would say, like, don't have this child or all these horrific things. And like, what is really the meaning of a child? And I feel like you look into that from a sort of religious angle, spiritual angle, medical angle. It's like, well, why? Who's to say a child has to be, you know, perfect according to these random set of standards that uh, some people in society think is really important. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think it was important to think about like why we become parents in this book because I think that the pressure to make children who are um, super charged with health and wellness and um, resilience, resilience is good, but the sort of like non-vulnerable human being, first of all, it's impossible to be non-vulnerable. And second, I think it, it, um, it, it's not the main re reason we become parents is to like create this like, person that transcends us or at least I don't think it's the reason we should be parents is to like make a little super baby or super uh, uh, mini me I guess you'd call it you know someone who climbs up the ladder even further than we were uh, so at least from my experience it felt like the reason that we become parents is just to be absolutely leveled like <laughs> yeah. No way to, I mean, even if you have the typical kid, like you will fail miserably at something in the course of it. And it's like, wow, it just, it just levels you. It's so humbling. And, you know, you always, you always think you're going to be a certain kind of parent and then you have the child you have and they require a different kind of parent, a different kind of parenting and they don't breastfeed or whatever it is, you know? So, um, so yeah, that was just, I wanted to bring that sort of angle into the book. So I wanted the book to not just be a story, um, but also to be some reflection and some, some, uh, some essaying, as we would say. Uh, and luckily, my editor was great and allowed me to do that. So, <laughs> you know, I know some readers will think, I just want story, you know, but I wanted there to be both. Well, it didn't feel choppy in any way. I mean, it was all seamlessly integrated. So I don't know, whatever you did, you did it well. <laughs> um, and you talked here about... Um, you know, this this moment where you were like, did I sign, like, I didn't sign up for this, like, but look what I got, right? Which I feel like, <laughs> I feel like any parent in some way, shape or form has said at some point, like, oh my God, you know, what, what do I have to deal with? But anyway, you said, um, of course I signed up for it. Every parent does. When we venture to become parents, we sign up for the fragility of life. We sign up for the precarious vulnerability of being human. We just don't always know it. 
which is so key. Anyway, I just had to read that quote because that was so nice. <laughs> Um, speaking of um, this religious aspect to your book and sort of spirituality and everything, you talked a lot in the book about your relationship with your husband and how he was actually sort of ordained during a time when you couldn't even be there and the fire alarm went off and all that and also had been a monk, training to be a monk and how he can like take 10 minutes to make tea and you're like, what are you doing? Um, and you said that you're, you would have titled a memoir about your relationship with red wine and green tea, which is so funny. So tell me, just tell me a little more about what it's like having that kind of influence because I do think in any sort of stressful situation, whether it's something with your child or something in your life, like the personality and sort of temperament of who you choose as a partner is so key to how you get through it. So just tell me a little about that dynamic and how it's affected your parenting really yeah um so i'm sort of i want to like create a, a an environment where people can improve a lot you know like i'm every day at the end of the day i think about like what what could i do better tomorrow and you know my husband justin is much more i think relaxed about that particularly in parenting so that works out really well because we create this balance i guess you know uh, so when fiona was really little she was, you know, six months. The advice that we got constantly was she needs to do more tummy time, more tummy time, more tummy time, because it strengthens a baby's core. Um, and, you know, I, I was like, well, then we have to do tummy time all the time. You know, like how, so eventually yeah, I asked the early interventionist, when, when, like how much, just give me, just give me a goal. I need a goal here so that I can hit the goal and I can rest which I'm not great at, and the, you know, then she said, oh, there's really no amount of tummy time that's too much, which was the worst advice for me, whereas my husband, he just didn't feel that same pressure. Um, it doesn't mean that he didn't also integrate therapy, but he didn't have this sense of, like, needing to do it and, and then taking all the joy out of it. He would find ways to make it fun, so he would have her on his chest, and he would just enjoy her, and she would look up at him, He'd play music in the background, the background, lots of reggae. So that was, it's, I think that's, it was, it ended up being great for Fiona to have that balance because she had this very like um, accepting sort of um, relaxed person and this person who was more uh, worried, I guess. <laughs> so, I mean, that worry is, the, is, I was the engine behind getting her language, you know? So it was me home with her and not being able to communicate with her as clearly as I wanted or as, as she wanted that made me think we need to find more people. And Justin was busy working. He was a priest. Um, so, so I think it, you know, it's helpful. Yeah. To have uh, two very different people in a kid's life. Uh, and that's what happened in this case. Yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm in your camp of personality types. I can never rest. I was on bed rest with my twins and I was like, no, I don't think so. Like, how am I going to do this? What do you mean, like, relax? I don't know. I don't even, like, allow myself to watch TV unless it's, like, pouring rain. Or I don't know. I have all these rules. And, um, uh, yeah. And, yeah, like, you know, don't eat dark chocolate in the morning. Things right. like that. Right. Yes. Wait till the <laughs> afternoon. Yeah. He'll just break those. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. No. I'm like, if I start this chocolate thing too early, just the rest of the day, like, what's going to happen? <laughs> Forget it. It's like the wheels off the train. Um, yeah. But uh, and also with the, the advice that the um, OT therapist said about there's never enough tummy time, it's like then you cannot accomplish it. Right. If there's no end goal, then you can never like cross it off the list. And that's the worst thing, too, when you're like trying to get yeah. things done. Well, and so that reminds me, he was really, he's also less, um, he was really good at just saying this person's advice or their influence in our lives isn't helpful. Let's just cut that voice out. I mean, doesn't, he didn't mean like, let's just no, cut yeah. that out, but he would be like, let's just sweep that away. And I would still hear that voice, you know? So um, at one point there was, I, I don't know if this made it into the book, but I had this therapy session where. Um, the therapist just pointed out a lot of things that Fiona wasn't doing well. And by therapy, I mean like physical therapy, gross fine motor therapy. Um, and you know, the, the therapist left and I leaned against the door, like slid down the door and just sobbed. And, um, it felt just like it was impossible to do a good job in this job of motherhood, which is what I mean when I say like we're leveled, right? In this case, I was trying to get Fiona to make some gross motor gains. Um, and my husband said, uh, he's like, I noticed that when these people come, they came like every two weeks 
And I, by these people, I mean these particular interventionists. There are amazing early interventionists out there, but the ones that we, the one we had, was really stressing me out. He would, he said, I noticed that she takes away your intuition. Like mm. when she's there, you start to doubt yourself and you start to listen more to outside voices. But he's like, you know what to do. Um, so it was really helpful to have him say to just get rid of the voices. Like if they're getting, if, if this person is causing you, he's like causing you to second guess yourself constantly, which is one of your most important tools as a mother is like this sort of knowing this like deep inner knowing he's like, it's not worth it. Um, so he was like, we should just cut him out. Like he, that particular person, he thought we could just not have them over. Um, I still was like, no, we have to do what we can. But it really did make me think like the most important thing is that for at least in parenting and particularly in parenting when you don't know when there's like no real clear map or other parents aren't doing what you're doing because you're, their kids are very different than yours. Um, that inner knowing is key and anything that interrupts that, like it's okay to get rid of that. That's good advice. I'm going to take your husband's advice. <laughs> Even in my, I have had many a, a, a door slide, you know, in tears myself. So I feel like many parents have had that downward <laughs> moment. Yeah. And, um, anyway, um, you had another, um, hold on, let me just flip to this quote because um, this was, I think, one of my favorite parts, this one particular moment, because it really speaks to sort of, how none of us really know what's going on and why in the world. And so all we can do is sort of go with what we have as information. Um, You, your mother, was it your mother or your mother-in-law? Your mother. um, You said one morning during her devotional time with her Bible opened on the kitchen table, the prayer she offered was a tear field and desperate why, as in why did you give this child Wolf Hirschhorn syndrome? The reply she heard was so striking and clear, so separate from herself that it stopped her straight. The voice said, You have no idea what I intend to do with this child. And after that, my mother trusted the body my daughter had been given. I love that. I read it out loud to my husband. I was like, this is it. This is the answer. You don't know. You don't know why. Maybe there's a bigger purpose to everything. Maybe for every struggle, and now I'm sounding like ridiculous and like all woo-woo, but I feel like with every struggle and with every challenge, like maybe there's a reason why, or maybe there's not. Maybe some is just bad luck, but I don't know. I just love that part. <laughs> yeah, that just, you know, the why question is apparently um, one that Americans ask a lot. Like, a, there was some famous Zen master who came to America to teach Zen, and he was like, wow, these Americans ask why a lot. <laughs> it is a question we like to ask, and um, and I think there's, a, there's like, great freedom in just saying, uh, we don't know, but perhaps there is bigger reasons that we could never, ever fathom. I was just talking to my kids about this. We were reading a book about space. Um, so I'm reading this big kid's book about space facts. And every once in a while, I'd be like, listen to this. There's a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. And there's, you know, billions of galaxies. Like, I can't even fathom that. Like, the human mind just can't fathom a whole lot beyond, you know, our worlds. So yeah, I actually, just for writing purposes, I I had my mom read that section and and I asked her if she was okay with it. And like, she actually tweaked what God, what, you know, what the voice that she'd heard. She's like, no, it wasn't quite that. It was this. So, and just in terms of the writing process, um, it was important for me not to like share other people's deep personal divine moments without actually getting their permission. Yeah, tell me more about the writing because you actually like teach writing. And so you even had little tidbits in here about like highlighting details and just like little bits of advice sprinkled through for writing itself. But tell me about how your whole approach to this book and how you how you just tackled the project and what it was like to write it. Okay, well, I was actually working on a book about my husband and I and our falling in love and the fact that he had been a monk um, and that I was like a like – recovering Christian, uh, or recovering from baptism, um, or Baptist faith, I guess. So I was working on this book and also had Fiona. Um, and she was about a year old when I really wanted to write about what I was experiencing, encounters we had with doctors, um, what I was learning about myself, uh, what it was just like to parent someone totally different from the, what, the, I guess the baby book, you know, said all that, you know, any sort of developmental book explained. So I started writing a blog on the side and I, 
I, it was almost like I was cheating on the main manuscript, you know, <laughs> by like eking out these blog posts. I wrote blog posts like at three in the morning while pumping milk. You know, I wrote it um, a lot when she, Fiona was napping. Um, all the while I was working on this other book. And then I started writing sometimes longer essays uh, about parenting a child with disabilities and um, maybe like five or ten of those. And eventually, like, it was a, I think it got to like 90 some blog posts and 10 literary essays. And um, then, and, and I knew that it, eventually I would write a book about Fiona, but I really just wanted to reach readers easily rather than like go through the slow route of literary publishing. Um, so, so after a, an essay called Super Babies Don't Cry, um, an editor and an agent contacted me around the same, like I think it was the same weekend, and those ended up being my agent and my editor for the book. So, um, so, so that book just sort of fell into place, and my agent said, or I said, well, I don't love writing book proposals. I like writing the book, and in, in the proposal I worry can kind of kill the book idea, because um, you're sort of planning the thing that I don't really want to be planned. Like I like to find myself in the writing or discover things in the writing. So she said, well, I'll help you. And she did. And I wrote it really quickly to try to kind of get it over with. I wrote the proposal. I wrote it from July to August. And then she submitted it to that one editor um, at Penguin Press in September. And they, um, we had a contract. So, so that's how it unfolded. And then, you know, this other book, that, that I was I was cheating on now that's kind of I haven't touched I haven't looked at it in a while I need to open that back up and figure out likely it will be different now given that it's like five years past so wow um so when you did the proposal though you hadn't written it right you had just written the blog posts and all the supporting materials and yeah that really only got you to the actual book deal um so so then what happened was I thought well I've got so much writing done surely this won't be that complicated um because there's just all of this material and I spent that time during the proposal reading that summer that I wrote the proposal I spent reading through the blog posts and the, the essays that I'd written and sometimes they I you know I had just been writing also in a word document that was accumulating pages of experiences that I'd had and I realized that I was cleaning out my garage at the same time or my uh, basement and it felt the same like go <laughs> through the basement and all the discordant stuff in boxes felt the same as sorting through all of these different pieces of writing and it was because there was no sort of narrative consistency in the voice mm. because like the person who was a mother to a one-year-old who'd just been diagnosed with wolf Hirschhorn syndrome seven months before you know yeah however long ago before that person was very different from the person who had a six-year-old whose kid was in like, kindergarten who was, um, who had, like, I fully, you know, accepted and embraced my daughter and learned so much. So, um, yeah, it was just, there was no shape, you know, as I had to figure out chronology and what was important and um, what was the voice going to be, you know, and so uh, that all took Time. And then, yeah, there are moments that I had written about in the blog that end up in the book, but under very different, they're all got, they all got recast in this different voice with different um, emphasis and, and everything sort of got expanded too, because I got the large space of a book rather than a little post. Wow. So how long did you think the writing took? The writing, I had, uh, they gave me 15 months for the first draft and I, I made my deadline. Congratulations. Which... <laughs> Um, and then it was nine months of revision rounds. So I think we, me, my editor and her assistant, my editor, my her assistant and I did three rounds of revisions. Um, so two years after the contract was signed, the book was accepted as done. And then we did, um, you know, fact check, legal review, um, stuff like that, like fine tuning, copy editing. So they spent from September to July. Um, this past July, uh, kind of getting it all ready and figuring out a book cover and things like that. And now I feel like the uncertainty that you write about in the book and things not going according to plan, of course, I'm sure I'm like the 8,000th person to ask you this question, but of course, this is now what every parent is and every person is dealing with with the pandemic and how life is just not on track in any way for anyone. And what do we do with that information? But now I feel like you're so uniquely positioned to handle that challenge. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I think there is a sort of a surrendering to uncertainty that that I practiced in Fiona's first year. Um, 
And early in the early months of the pandemic, I kind of feel like it's things have shifted so much. Um, in some ways, I've shifted not at all in others, but I did get the same feeling um, that I had when when Fiona was uh, like six months or whatever. I would get this like quiet sort of feeling, kind of in my in my heart or in my chest that was like, "There's nothing that you can do, and there, all you can do is just sort of fall into this and." pray or hope or trust that something will be caught here, that you will be caught, that you'll you'll be okay, I guess. And, and okay doesn't mean everything will work out great. I'll keep, you know, you'll keep the job. Your kid will walk. Like, it meant it will be a different kind of okay, perhaps, than you would perhaps like, but still okay. So I got that feeling again, you know, in the first week or first, first month or two of the pandemic. Um, and it was comforting because I thought, oh, I have been here before. I've been in a place where I don't know if my kid is going to walk. I don't know if she's going to talk. I don't know if she's going to live till she, you know, past two. Um, what does that mean? And how can I go forward? And what, it, what I, at the time, what it meant was you love the hell out of life. You know, you, you take it all in as much as you can. Um, and love your daughter as best you can. It doesn't mean I need plenty. I don't. Doesn't mean I don't need introverted time alone, you know, to to journal or what have you. But um, but yeah, I think it's still a good lesson. When things are really uncertain, it brings us closer to the sense of what things really mean and what really matters. And it's not fun or comfortable, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Um, but I think it does click things into focus in a helpful way. I feel like you had um, a whole passage about this at the end. I circled it and I was like, ah, meaning of life. <laughs> um, but you were like, the point of this human life, I believe, is love. And the ridiculous and brave and risky act of love turns my heart into taffy, stretches it across the broad spectrum of human feeling. My daughter has given me a thousand portraits of grief and a thousand portraits of joy. I hurt, I long, I exalt, I rejoice. Loving my daughter tenderizes me, makes me more human. And yes, my chest sometimes aches from this work but the ache in my chest is a cousin of joy. So amazing. It's Thank so beautiful. You. Oh my gosh. Um, your writing, I love your writing. It's like, it's it's like, it's as if we're talking, but it's it's more literary than that. And it's like, you just want to like sit down and, and be your friend. I don't know. <laughs> um, oh, but uh, it's, so, it's so evocative. And I don't know, I'm not being very articulate myself in describing your writing. I can't even speak, but you know. <laughs> Um, and then you had these like little funny lines like vacationing while parenting is kind of like juggling while sleeping. I mean, that's like perfect. That should be on a pillow that like every parent should be given in the hospital. It's like or at every every airline should have that, you know, like let's just like make these difficult situations humorous because like what else can we do? <laughs> So. Yeah, they could just give that instead of those baggies of like formula, you know, coupons. Right? Who needs those? I mean, I mean, come on. Forget the bibs. Forget the bibs. We'll get bibs. <laughs> um, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Yeah. Um, let me see. I, I was just talking to a friend of mine who wants to tell her life story, and she writes poems, and they're you know she loves writing poems because she can get sort of lost in them, and they they surprise her, and then she comes out on the other side, and she doesn't um, she didn't predict that she would go there, and she loves that about poetry, but she's really overwhelmed to write her life story. Um, she and I thought I gave her this advice, maybe it's useful. Sometimes we need constraints um, to feel free. So for her, you know, I was thinking you have this like 20 years she wants to tell in this memoir. What if she gave herself the constraint of she's going to write as many sections as it takes, but they're only going to be 300 words. So it sort of feels like a poem. So write 300 words, write your way into it. Maybe it's a scene, maybe it's a reflection. Be surprised by it, and but it has to be over in 300 words. That's not necessarily a constraint that works for everybody, but I do think, I do believe as a writer in the enabling constraints. So as a poet, if I start getting sloppy or uninspired, I'll go back to meter. Like I go back to iambic pentameter or whatever form. I'll go. I'll try to write a huzzle or some kind of obscure form, because something it's helpful for me and I think a lot of writers to feel constrained in one way and then it feels liberating in another. So um, I like that. I like to play with that as a writer. That's great. You could do it with time frames too. Like you can only write about one year of your life or you could make it happen over one day or right. Things like that. Yeah. 
Yes, I have a friend, Sonia Huber. This, my friend of mine just wrote a book, or has a book coming out. It's apparently a nonfiction book about one day, but inside that day is like all of this, um, you know, other stuff woven into it. So constraints can be helpful. You know, external forms can be helpful that you borrow. That's one advice, one bit of advice, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Heather. Thanks for your amazing book. Thanks for sharing your story. Um, you know, I, I know your mom said a voice told her that it's, you know, who knows what this child is intended to do, but at the least it, it changed my time reading this book and my time meeting you and getting to know you and your story and um, feeling less alone in my slide down my door into the tear land. So, you know, it, it has... <laughs> It's I don't think you're calling it a slide because now I'm envisioning like a, a playground slide, you know, like we, like it seems fun now. We just slide down our doors. Yeah, we're all sliding together. It's a it's a wild ride down the slide. <laughs> it's not just a descent into depression. <laughs> and it's not alone either. Particularly now, everyone is everyone's doing it. You everyone's know? doing it. You got to do it to be cool. So <laughs> anyway, um, well anyway, thank you. Um, thank thanks you for coming much. on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, my pleasure. Bye. Yeah. Bye.